So kicking off, kicking us off this morning, um, we have a great session um, planned on participant engagement and cohort studies. And um, I'd like to pass this on to our moderators, uh, Dr. Manuk Shomaka. She's a, a researcher at the Institute of Cancer Research in London and Dr. Erica Reese Ponya. She is a principal scientist of the American Cancer Society. So thank you, you guys take it off. Yes, hello and welcome to the second day of the virtual annual COVID consortium meeting. As uh, Nonia already stated, my name is Minouk. I'm a senior scientist on the generation study in the UK, which is a study of 113,000 women followed up for, to look at breast cancer and other types of cancer. And I'm also a member of the steering group. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Erica Rees Punya, who uh, is at the American Cancer Society. And together we'll moderate the first session uh, this morning, uh, during which we hope to learn about some recent experiences uh, with participant engagement in three quite different types of studies. Uh, we have three great speakers lined up and I'm handing over to Erica now to introduce the first one. Thank you so much. Hello everyone. Um, so yes, I have the honor of introducing some of our speakers for today. And up first we have Justin Henches. He is the Chief Financial and Management Officer, as well as the Acting Chief of Engagement Officer um, for the All of Us Research Program. He has extensive government experience and is dedicated to ensuring that everyone is seen and heard at all levels of government. He'll be talking to us today about the engagement strategies and lessons learned from the All of Us Research Program. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Manuk. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, I apologize for my voice. I'm fighting a little bit of a cold this morning, um, but I'm happy to be here to discuss the All of Us Research Program and our engagement work with diverse communities. Uh, next slide, please. So the All of Us Research Program is a longitudinal effort to gather data from 1 million or more diverse participants living in the United States. Launched in 2015 as part of the Precision Medicine Initiative, the program's mission is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. Next slide, please. To meet our mission, we have four strategic objectives. The first, and to me the most important, is to nurture relationships with our participant partners for decades. The second is to deliver the largest, richest biomedical data set ever that's easy, safe, and free to access. We want to catalyze a robust ecosystem of researchers that can use this data to solve problems in communities. And we want to build and maintain a strong team that can deliver on these priorities and our mission. Next slide, please. From the beginning of our program, diversity and engagement have been key aspects to our mission. We seek to bring together those who have been historically underrepresented in biomedical research. And by underrepresented in biomedical research, we mean racial and ethnic minorities, sexual and gender minorities, individuals with disabilities, those from geographies not serviced by large medical centers, um, and those that are younger and um, older than the traditional folks engaged in research. We're committed to engaging communities in safe spaces through trusted messengers to ensure they have the opportunity to learn more about biomedical research, precision medicine, and all of us. We're meeting individuals and communities where, where they are is, a vital, uh, is vital for building trust and their understanding of the value of their program to their committee, communities. And for our program, participants are true partners being incorporated, incorporated into most elements of program development, including the governance of our large consor consortium of partners. Next slide, please. So as of today, we have over 356,000 participants who have started the enrollment process, and over 271,000 have completed the initial steps of our protocol, including providing biospecimen samples. Of course, COVID has shut down many of our in-person activities for us over the last seven months, but we continue to engage with our communities via digital means, and I'll talk about some of the ways that we're doing that in a minute. Now, of the 271,000 that have completed the initial steps of our protocol, over 
self-identify as belonging to one or more communities that have been historically underrepresented in biomedical research. And over 50% self-identify as belonging to racial or ethnic minority communities. Uh, next slide, please. I just want to take a moment then to talk about some of our engagement activities. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me for one second. So we know that it takes time and space to build trust. Our approach to engagement is to meet people and communities where they are along their journey towards participation and research. We are working daily to establish relationships with partners who are important trusted messengers with the community to build that trust and facilitate conversations about research, about precision medicine, and about all of us. We do not go into a community and ask folks to enroll in the program right away. We want to take the time to work with the community so that they can understand research and the value of research to their community and then make an informed choice about whether they want to participate in all of us or not. Our engagement approach is dynamic and it's through these conversations that, that we learn and that we can make adjustments to, to our program and how we work with communities to build that trust and bring communities into the program. We have developed comprehensive training and tools that support our community partners in their work. And we also trust our community partners while using those tools to also be the stewards of the information that, or to be the, the folks that work with their communities. So while we provide uh, tools at the national level, we also are trusting our local partners to engage with their communities as they see fit. Uh, next uh, slide, please. And that gets into, here are some of the examples of the different engagement models we use, um, and we use these across the country. And like I said, some of these are at the national level where we will do things from the national program. Uh, for example, we have a national newsletter that goes to all of our participants. However, many of the activities, though, are tailored to fit the communities and the partners that are working within those communities at the local level. So we are a national and program that is really trying to engage with communities at the local level. I'll just give two case study examples of that. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so this is a co collaboration between LULAC, Access, and Unidos U.S. They facilitate conversations in the community through culturally appropriate based activities such as cafecitos, charlas and faith-based faith -based community outreach. These models often, often used to directly engage and learn about community interests, interpretation of value, the value of research to the community, and where we need to do better as a program. The goals of these events is to focus on quality conversations that will, uh, that will bring more people into, get more people interested in biomedical research and therefore our program, and perhaps will potentially enroll in our program. We also want to help individuals feel comfortable sharing information by word of mouth with their friends, their family, and their community. So through this model, we've learned that, um, and I know many of you know this, but a trusted messenger is the best way to facilitate these often hard conversations in culturally competent and culturally humble ways. Um, a bureaucrat from D.C. going into a community with no knowledge of the community isn't the best way to engage uh, with, with that community. And by focusing on personalized and quality conversations, we're, we're getting more people that are translate or more people that are expressing interest in enrolling in the program and therefore are more willing to share information about the program and about biomedical research in general with their family and, and family members and friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. Next slide, please. Another case study is with the Dane County YMCA. So Dane County is the county where Madison, Wisconsin is in the United States. And our Wisconsin Healthcare Provider Organization, which is one of our enrollment centers at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, they've developed a relationship over time. It's been a longstanding relationship. And recently, the Y invited the HPO into their facility to host a joint educational and enrollment event that resulted in enrolling new participants on site. And one of the things we learned here is similar to the last one is the trusted partner. 
the Y is a trusted partner in Dane County. And so by partnering with them, the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, could have a, a good conversation with their members and, and gain some of the trust from their members. Um, we know that, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that we've, we've found is that participants, when they trust their organizations, they will trust the information that's being provided for those organizations. So we take that very seriously and build, work to build those relationships. And one of the other things that, that we've learned is that engagement and then enrollment happens in safe spaces. So by doing these uh, events with trusted partners in their locations, um, the community members feel safer in having real dialogue and, and asking real questions about the program. <clears throat> Excuse me again, sorry about that. Uh, next slide, please. So to date, we have more than 40 community and provider partners that work with more than 80 other organizations across the country <clears throat> to encourage their community to learn about all of us, to learn about precision medicine, to learn about bi biomedical research. And from December 2018 through the end of March 2020, um, our network has facilitated approximately uh, 2,255 in-person digital or other activities or events. We've made more than 15.3 million impressions, and engaged more than 2.4 million people with, and having more than 4,500 4, hours of quality conversations. Now, and at the end of March, we uh, stopped in-person enrollment and engagement activities for the program. We're slowly opening those back up, but during this time, we have been looking and working with our partners to diversify our engagement strategies. And we've grown to a lot of uh, digital events. Of course, we recognize that digital events leave out a portion of the population because of the digital divide. And so we're now working, we're also working with our partners to design engagements that can be still happen during the time of COVID, but are that are safe and accessible to all. So I believe that we've that all of us has built a robust ecosystem over the last couple of years, with the goal of meeting people where they are, to learn about us, to build trust with us as a program, and importantly for us to hear from them and to improve how we operate as a program. For us, engagement is definitely a two-way street. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, I encourage you all to learn more about our program. Uh, thank you for the time today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, such an amb ambitious and interesting project. Uh, there is probably time for one question. I was just wondering, um, how do you assess the effectiveness of these engagement projects? Obviously, uh, this, you know, it requires a lot of resources and costs. Is there any way to, you know, assess what it works at all or, you know, which avenues work better than others? Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. So this is something that we've actually, um, we've been doing at the local level. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm really sorry about this. Um, we've been doing this at the local level with our partners where they've been able to look at um, what has been working with for them in their local communities. So, so each of our partners does that local assessment. What we're working on uh, now as a national program is determining what are the best evaluation criteria we can use across the United States. So that if we have a partner that's say working in Wisconsin and um, they, they have an event that works for, for them, we could also then compare that to an event that works in, say, South Florida. And obviously, we'd want to take into account the difference between South Florida and Wisconsin, but we think that we can learn uh, as we compare those events and as we compare those uh, criteria, uh, evaluation criteria, we can learn a lot that can help both our national program as well as in the local community uh, update their events to really reach more people and drive conversations about the importance of biomedical research. Okay, and could you talk a little bit more about how participants are involved in governance in the study? Uh, sure, so we, have, um, <clears throat> so we have a number of different governance boards in our program. Almost all of our awardees have a community or participant advisory board, and so these are, these are participants or community members from the local community. So for example, the University of Pittsburgh 
in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, has a local community advisory board that advises them on how to implement the program in their area. We also have a national advisory board for the whole program where we have participant ambassadors that give a global or we'll have a national uh, perspective for the national headquarters, the national uh, part of the program. And then we also have uh, those participant ambassadors and other participants sit on other aspects of our governance process. So, for example, we have participants that sit on our science committee. So as we're looking at what are the next data types we want to uh, receive from participants, what's the, the direction we want to drive the science, participants are involved in those conversations. Excellent. Um, so it's probably time to move on to the next talk. We have Kimberly Bertrand, who is an assistant prof professor at the Boston University School of Medicine and epidemiologist at the Sloan Epidemiology Center at Boston University. She, um, her current research focuses primarily on cancer risk and outcomes in African American women. She has been co-investigated with the Black Women Health Study since 2015. So over to Kimberly. Thanks, Minouk. Um, I'm excited to tell you guys today about our work with the participants in the Black Women's Health Study. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, oh, the font is a little bit funny here, but um, the Black Women's Health Study is a closed cohort, actually. It was established in 1995 among 59,000 African-American women um, across the U.S., so in all 50 states. Um, primarily, they were recruited from um, subscriber lists to Essence Magazine, if you remember that magazine, um, as well as membership of professional organizations um, and also word of mouth. Um, I'm sorry, these are so small. This is not what my slides look like on my, on my slide. Um, the response rates are over 50%, sorry, they're over 80% at each follow-up cycle. Um, next slide, please. Um, and that, to achieve those, those response rates of over um, 80% takes an enormous amount of effort from our staff. Um, and our primary goals for participant engagement in the, in the study are, of course, cohort retention, research dissemination, as well as um, participant-driven research, so allowing participants to really um, have their voices shown in the research studies that we do. Um, and underlying all of these core goals is a foundation of trust, and so you'll see the theme echoed from the previous talk, um, especially in this population, given the legacy of exploitation of the African American community in medical research in the past. Um, so we're really cognizant of this. Next slide, please. Um, uh, sorry, next slide, please. So. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about our follow-up procedures. So we send health survey questionnaires every two years um, since 1995. And to retain 80% of the cohort um, at each follow-up cycle, we actually send up to seven mailings um, about three months apart. And each, at least one of the mailings is sent via priority mail. Um, and that's just for our main questionnaires, actually. We also send out supplemental surveys for diagnoses of different medical conditions. Um, we request medical records for participants diagnosed with cancer and other illnesses. Um, and we have a number of sub-studies as well. We've collected saliva, we've collected blood, we've collected mammograms, um, and then we've done special questionnaires rolled out over the years, um, for example, on cognitive decline, on hair loss, on religion and spirituality, oral health, um, most recently on COVID-19. Um, and we communicate with these participants not only via mail and the web, um, but also via phone. So our, you can hear them through the halls. Our staff are on the phone constantly with participants, not only to, um, to call non-responders, but also to answer questions about the study. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, um, so what is what I what I see and what is almost one of the most fun parts for me is actually talking to our participants on the phone and I hear it through the halls, as I mentioned. Um, and so I think the reason we're able to achieve this 80% response rate is because of the personal connections that our staff develop with the participants. Um, in fact, many of our research assistants and research coordinators have been with the study for many, many years. Some of them have been around since the inception of the cohort in 1995. So that, that, that real commitment on both the participants and the staff's um, side really helps to develop that connection. Um, so this is a, a comment from a staff member 
Um, I'll read it. There have been times when participants' comedic flair has generated spurts of laughter, while other times when they're open about their pain and suffering, it's difficult not to cry with them. There's an authenticity to their many anecdotes, and I smile when I think of how many times they've given me advice that I didn't ask for. Call me anytime as though we're neighbors. Next slide, please. And the participants write in um, and call us all the time too about their experiences as being part of the study. And these are just a couple of recent quotes from some participants. Um, the first one, I appreciate your persistence. You didn't give up on me. I'm glad I'm contributing to the betterment of black women's health overall. And the survey helps me too. It helps me take inventory of my own choices and motivates me to step it up. And I think even the older women are also recognizing that it's not just about them. So this is a quote from another participant we are not only helping ourselves, but our own daughters and granddaughters. It is not often that you do something that will affect so many in a positive way in such a short amount of time. Um, the time and effort will affect women for years to come. So I think, you know, given our relationships with these participants, they really feel like they're part of the study. And I think that they, they truly understand um, what the goals of the study are. Next slide, please. Um, so another huge effort on our part is disseminating our research findings. Um, and next slide, please. And we do this through a variety of means. Um, one of the most popular and common means is we have been sending out regular newsletters at least twice a, twice a year. And these are glossy brochures that we send in the mail. They are also available on our website for people who choose to receive them in an electronic format. Um, in these newsletters, which can range from four to six to eight pages, we present summaries of recent research studies. We answer questions about the logistics of participating in a, in a study. For example, what happens to my data? How do you keep it confidential? Um, and I mentioned they're also available on our website. Um, speaking of our website, next slide, please. Um, so our website was established in, 19, in 2013, and this is just a graph showing um, annual visits to our website. And this is a, it's a public website, so it's open to participants. So the part on the website where participants can fill out their questionnaire is password enabled, so only participants can log into that. But you can see the spikes are in odd years, and I think that really reflects the fact that we send out our questionnaires in odd years, so we have more people driving to the website. And the most popular pages are um, study publications, so press releases and information about recent published studies, um, as well as um, a video, which I'll talk about in a minute, BWH history and our research team information. Um, next slide, please. We have a Facebook page um, and anybody can go to this page. So we're not, you know, it's not, again, it's public. It's not just participants engaging, but there's some engagement. Um, recently, we held a webinar, which I'll talk about, and we had over um, 2,000 um, impressions. Next slide, please. And then in terms of um, going out into the community, um, we participate in a number of community events, lectures, as well as center visits. And these are mostly often by request of participants in our study. So we'll get a call and say, can you come and talk to us about XYZ? We'd like to hear more about the study, for example, at a church, sister to sister community conversations, which is a health initiative in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We've gone um, to the Museum of Science to do a health day there. Um, and so one of um, some of the other types of things we've done um, in the lower right hand corner is actually a picture of um, an eighth grade class visit. This participant was a teacher in an eighth grade at a, um, at a private school in San Diego, and she was taking her class to Boston, and she came and brought the class to the Black Women's Health Society to visit us. And, you know, we interacted with the students, and this really, um, you know, helps to, to develop those personal connections again. We've also participated in interviews on local radio and TV programs as well. Um, so again, these are by request of the participants often. Next slide, please. Um, this is an example of a picture. Um, one of our investigators was invited to speak at the Association of Black Women in Higher Education in Chicago several years ago. Again, um, a participant who's on the board there. Um, and this is a photo of, um, we actually extended the invitation to this conference to all local um, participants if they wanted to go. And this is a photo of several of the participants who attended and what they're holding up there is their 20 year certificate of participation in the Black Women's Health Study. So they all brought it um, and, and posed for a picture. So that was really fun. Next slide, please. 
Um, as I alluded to, last year we commissioned a brief film. It's about five minutes and it's available on our website. Um, this film was really intended to showcase both the history of the Black Women's Health Study and our goals for the future. And um, it featured investigators from our study as well as uh, members of our advisory board and real live um, Black Women's Health Study participants, not actors here. Um, and so this film was actually aired at the um, meeting of the American Public Health Association and is now archived on our, on our website. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the things we've been most excited about this year is that 2020 actually marks the 25th anniversary of our study. And we had planned, uh, or we were in the planning phases of a, of a large event um, that was disrupted due to COVID. But in fact, I think um, if you move to the next slide, um, it turned out even better. So what we've been able to do in this virtual world we live in now is we've um, initiated and rolled out a series of webinars um, in celebration of participants um, honoring their contributions for over 20 for 25 years and our our first webinar was held um, in September and this was so fun to watch live because the over 2000 um, women from our cohort um, and um, registered for the seminar was shown over zoom and then live streamed on Facebook and you could see the chats going on the side and the participants were chatting with each other. And it was um, about a 20 minute presentation and then the rest of the 40 minutes was a Q and a with investigators and members of our advisory board so that was really fun. Um, most recently, a couple weeks ago, we hosted our second webinar of the series to talk about COVID-19, um, as well as um, how the BWHS is involved in research on COVID-19. And our next um, webinar will be held in January. Next slide, please. Um, and so moving to the future and um, I guess the, the present and the future is really engaging participants in a more formal way as well with the, re with the actual research we're doing. Next slide, please. Um, so since 2004, we have had a participant advisory group and anybody who's a member of the cohort is welcome to join this advisory group. It's now at 355 members. Um, and we turn to this group to test out new questions on our surveys and we invite research ideas from the entire cohort. Every questionnaire has a comment field where people can write in their research ideas. But um, especially from this group where we, we use them as a founding board for future research directions. They are also the, the group of um, invested participants that we turn to for participation in pilot studies as we're, um, as we're delving into new ideas. Um, they provide uh, ideas and suggestions for topics for our newsletters, for example. Um, and so, you know, an example of um, one of the ways that women have driven our research is um, in 1995, when we first rolled out our questionnaires, um, many participants wrote back and commented to us about the need for studies of uh, related to premature birth rates in Black women. And so we ended up adding um, many, many questions on reproductive health in, in future questionnaires. More recently, participants, as they're aging now, the median age is about 68. Um, they're interested in more research on cognitive decline and healthy aging. And so we've added questions and are beginning research in that area too. I just have one more slide. Um, so some of the pilot study examples um, that we've used this participant advisory group um, for is to pilot a recent study of religion and spirituality. Sometimes these can be very sensitive questions. So we wanted to make sure we were asking them in a sensitive way. Um, we've also um, asked them about their feelings of genetic research and return of genetic research results. We use these preliminary data in recent grant applications. And then moving forward, and um, we have a couple of studies that are actually more formally, including patient advocates as part of our research teams, including a study on insomnia, where we have a participant with insomnia, um, really helped develop the grant proposal and has been part, you know, um, a, a valued contributor um, every step of the way of the study and our recently funded study on return of breast cancer genetic results um, will also include a patient advocate there. So we really wanna make sure that we are including participants and getting their ideas for where the study should be going in the future. Um, so my last slide is just the acknowledgements. Um, Dr. Rosenberg and Dr. Palmer are the PIs of the study. Um, and then Delia Russell, Carolyn Conti, Maria Petzold helped me gather the data for this presentation. And we, of course, acknowledge our funding from the NCI, which we've had since 1995. And a very special thanks to the participants and the staff of the Black Women's Health Study. Um, that's the end. Thank you. That's so great, Kim. Um, 
those participant quotes in particular are really great and I think really speak to the hard work that you guys have done to build this community that you really engage really well. Um, so can you actually talk a little bit more, take a minute or two about how you've built this community, this team? So for example, I'm sort of thinking maybe are there opportunities for participants to connect with each other? And if so, what role do you think that that plays in their um, commitment to the study? That, that's a that's a great um, that's a great question. So you know I have not been around since the beginning. <laughs> I've only been there five years. So I, I, you know I, I have to give the credit to the original investigators and the original staff who really made this cohort come together. Um, in terms of um, as, as I mentioned, I think you know engaging the participants in a very personal way has been what I've noticed over the years. Um, you know, I, like I said, I, I hear them on the phone in my, <laughs> from my office and they're laughing with the participants, they're talking to the participants. You know, we've done a lot of outreach um, in terms of ways for the participants to engage with each other. That has been primarily um, in the past over Facebook, but now with these new webinar series that we implemented, I think, you know, to me, it was an, an unanticipated um, result where I saw these participants coming together and in the chat, really, Erica, they were exchanging phone numbers. It was so wonderful to see. So I, I think that is a great point and maybe something we should consider a little bit more formally in the future because there is a sense of belonging and I think sisterhood a little bit. At the same time as research investigators, you know, we are committed to keeping all of participant data confidential. And so that's why we haven't connected people in the past. You know, we, we have promised participants as part of their consent process that we will not share their information, including their name and their address and where they live with anybody else, including other participants. So it's really up to the participants themselves to get together and they can, you know, sometimes participants do, you know, disclose that they're participating. For example, we might feature them in a newsletter where, with their permission. And so in that way, participants can engage with each other. Um, but otherwise, I don't really feel necessarily that it's up to us given our, you know, need to protect their data. Yeah. That definitely makes sense. And then just quickly before we move to the next speaker, um, do you have any evidence that, that suggests that these events that you hold and um, different webinars that you give actually help with higher response rates to surveys? Yeah, that's a very good question. And um, I think that the calls and the additional mailings and the priority mailings absolutely help with response rates. Um, you know, we get the bulk of retention and response from our very first mailing. So, but these are our sort of good responders, our, you know, go-to people. Um, but there's lots of people who are like, thank you for sending it to, again, I didn't get to it. Um, in terms of the in-person events, um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think they're more local and small. And so I don't think that they've likely had a big hit. Um, but but even if they encourage one more person to participate in a new sub-study or to donate a blood sample or something, I think it's worth it. And I think it's also part of our overarching mission um, to improve the health of Black women. So I think it's vital that we continue those efforts, even if it's not um, making a big dent in our response rates. As for the webinars, I think there's likely that we will be able to um, see improvements in our response rates, but this is not a questionnaire year for us and it's, it's really too soon to tell. Thanks for that question. That's great. Thanks so much, Kim. Uh, for the sake of time, we'll move to the next speaker and we'll have some time for more questions at the end. But finally, we have Dr. Susan Pinney. She is a professor in the Department of Environmental Health in the College of Medicine at the University of Cincinnati, the director of the Center for Environmental Genetics and the Cancer Risk Control and Prevention Program Leader for the Cincinnati Cancer Center. And today she's gonna to be speaking about community engagement and participant retention in BSERP. Thank you very much. Yes, what I'm going to describe is how engagement with the breast cancer survivor community and breast cancer advocates really helped us with participant retention in a study of puberty, a cohort study of puberty. Next. Next slide, please. So this study, let me first tell you a little bit about this study. The study was designed and actually conducted at three sites 
to determine the effect of environmental exposures on the timing of events during puberty, especially breast development. So did, do environmental exposures affect or cause breast development to be earlier or later? And we enrolled girls at six to seven years and we followed them for all of 12 years. We conducted in Cincinnati clinical exams every six months and these exams included maturation staging and phlebotomy. And by maturation staging, I mean staging breast development and also pubic care appearance. So it was a really tough recruit and also lots of retention challenges considering the study methods. I'm going to describe today what retention methods we used with, um, with the, the girls and how the advocates helped us with that and also a survey study that we conducted on retention methods. Next slide. So one retention method we used, which many studies use, are newsletters and cards, uh, birthday cards and holiday cards. And our newsletters were full of information, very much appreciated by the parents, but we also had a special page for the girls, um, which uh, value, showed that we really valued their participation and gave them information about the study. Next slide. We also used other retention methods used by other studies, cash. At each study visit, the girls received some cash and the amount depended on what procedures they completed. So if they um, had a phlebotomy, gave blood, they got extra money, uh, I think $25 additional at that study visit. We also provided gift cards for parents um, at each study visit for completion of questionnaires and diet recall interviews and the parents also received a gas card to compensate for travel. Something that was very uh, popular were the thank you gifts we provided at the study. So the girls at each visit each year got a large t-shirt, which actually served as the clinical visit gown. And each year the girls um, were able to vote on a different color of the t-shirt. We also had great age appropriate thank you gifts and I have to credit our study coordinators which with helping us to choose just the right gifts. The first year we gave them Polly Pockets which are little dolls that fit in your pocket and some books. We, other years we gave craft kits, after shower wraps, messenger bags, a whole variety of gifts. And these gifts were donated or deeply discounted um, from real realtors, uh, retailers helped us out by either donating gifts or deeply discounting them. And our advocates were very uh, instrumental in obtaining these gifts. Next slide. We also tried to give the girls um, ways to have fun at the clinical visits. So they um, had positive uh, associations with it. And you can see um, one of the ways was we had a coloring book which described the steps during the clinical visit. We also, while they were waiting in the waiting room for their um, time, we had craft activities and movies and the waiting room was hosted by the advocates. The advocates also brought us handheld electronic games to use between exam stations. We tried to reduce stress through distraction and Frank Biro actually held the girl's hands during the phlebotomies. He danced sometimes. I don't have a video of that. He took their blood pressures, which um, gave them a connection with him as one of the PIs of the study. The girls also at the end of the study participated in creating videos about the visits, um, which were very, very interesting on what they thought of their contribution. Next slide. Two of the advocates designed completely the um, coloring books that describe the study methods, uh, Linda Croucher and Jamie Schwartz. And actually, um, unfortunately, they both died about a year after they created the, the coloring book. Next slide. Some other yearly events were very popular in terms of retention. We had a yearly gala for the girls and parents and we had them at different locations like the Cincinnati Zoo, the Cincinnati Aquarium. Here's a picture from the one we had at the Red Stadium with Rosie Red. Uh, the girls got a tour of the stadium. Some um, celebrities uh, came to our gala. 
and we made baseball cards for each of the girls with rosy red. Uh, Frank Biro, this is a picture of Frank there at our gala on the river on a riverboat. Uh, we had various stations on the riverboat to show ways to make nutritional smoothies. We showed chair yoga. So in many ways here, again, the advocates contributed to the success of the galas. We also had a yearly educational program for parents and the greater community. Um, we have a, uh, attendance of about 150 or more at this program. We included talks that updated them on the study findings and invited investigators from the other side, such as Susan Teitelbaum uh, from Mount Sinai. We also, um, the advocates work were instrumental in planning these events, and we invited advocates from other sites to speak and interact. Um, here you see in the bottom slide, uh, bottom of the slide, two advocates from the Long Island uh, Breast Cancer Group. Next slide. So it worked. Over 12 years, at the end of 12 years, our retention rate was above 60%. And I think that's quite remarkable considering the study methods, uh, which made a big challenge for retention. We, um, the retention dropped most after the first visit, and then when we switched from every six months visits to visits every year. Next slide. So we did a survey to ask the girls about what retention methods work best. And the participants, we had 230 who participated in the survey in our study called Growing Up Female. The um, racial distribution of the participants in the survey mirrored that of the cohort. And the girls were a median age of 13 years when they participated in this survey. Next slide. The results were very interesting. Overall, when we asked them what things make them want to stay in the study, receiving cash, receiving an annual gift in front of the visit scored most highly. Um, the newsletter and the parent birthday cards were um, the retention methods that were endorsed the least, which is interesting. When we looked at this by race, um, Caucasian girls endorsed the gala, the birthday card, the study t-shirt, those kind of um, retention methods more than African-American girls, where the African-American girls endorsed um, a method we used, we reduced the frequency of phlebotomy at the end of the study so that they only uh, were asked to provide a blood sample at two or five visits. And that goes along with the hesitancy of African-Americans to provide blood samples. So that uh, was the retention method most endorsed by African-Americans. The retention methods didn't vary a lot by the age of the girls, but the youngest group um, certainly uh, endorsed most the birthday card retention method, and the parental gift card uh, was most endorsed by the girls, um, the oldest group of girls. Next slide. I'm gonna skip the slide in the interest of time, so let's just go to the next slide. We also asked the girls an open-ended question. What is the prime, or actually asked the parents, what is the primary reason you keep your daughter enrolled in growing up female? And from the responses, we produced this word cloud. And from the word cloud, you can see that cancer, research study, helping, those were the themes that came out as being most important, the most important reasons for keeping their daughter enrolled in growing up female. When we asked the girls a similar question um, and did an analysis, coded and uh, did an analysis of the responses, they mentioned most frequency advancing medicine, external motivation, and altruism. Next slide. We did one other thing that we firmly believe fostered retention. We uh, collected blood and urine to measure environmental biomarkers, and we reported all of those results back to study participants. One biomarker, that for PFOA, one of the PFOS group, uh, we found that a portion of our cohort, especially girls living in one community, had higher levels than the national average. Some of them actually were substantially high. 
So by reporting this back and having meetings with the, um, the parents of the study participants, we really gained their trust. We also shared this information with public health officials and followed it up. We re-measured the levels in the girls. And I think this whole process of engaging them with our findings, and especially this unexpected finding, fostered participation and retention. Next slide. Speaking of communities, we are also extending our efforts to the scientific community. So we have a lot of data and biospecimens from the study at all three of the sites. And we are now offering those data and biospecimens to collaborators, outside collaborators, who may be interested in addressing a research question with us. There's a publications committee that has primary oversight of what research questions are addressed and how, both for uh, internal puberty study collaborates, collaborators and outside investigators. And if you're interested in a collaboration, you need to first file an application. And in order to get that, you can contact me as I am the chair of the Data Research Com Resource Committee. Next slide. So this is my final slide. This is a picture of the Cincinnati group, both investigators and our very supportive ad advocates um, after one of our looking upstream educational events for the community. And on this slide um, is also my email address in case you would want to contact me um, to uh, initiate a collaboration. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, you make it look so attractive that I'm sure my, my nine-year-old daughter would love to take part in your study. Um, so um, there have been quite a few comments already in the Q&A box. Um, one of them being that why, you know, why we shouldn't actually publish uh, on, on page participant engagement uh, in the code consortium. Uh, sharing all the experiences from the various studies. So I was wondering whether any of you have already published on uh, your methods of engagement and the effectiveness of it. So this question is to any of you. So I'll just, we do have a manuscript and actually we have submitted it to two different journals without success. Uh, which is which is disappointing. I'm not sure we've had the right journals. Um, and so I certainly would be interested in suggestions for other journals. After giving this talk, I thought of a few things, a um, few ways we might um, enhance the interest in the manuscript. But a lot of the information with more details is the same that I presented today. Hmm. Interesting. I'm sure we'll continue this conversation um, offline at some point. <laughs> uh, Erica? Yes. Um, so I've got a question here. Um, interested in learning a bit more about engaging Latinos. So perhaps this is a question for Justin, I think. I know you briefly mentioned some work with Unidos. So what strategies have you used to engage this growing and very diverse community and were they successful? Sorry, I was having a, a mute issue on my end. Um, so, so I think that's a great question. And, and it is, with, with all of this, um, I think it's important for our, from our perspective to note that when we talk about communities like the Latinx community, that it isn't just a monolithic group, right? That there are different communities within that community. And so we try to take a very local approach here. So we've had some examples where, <clears throat> excuse me, we've had like, we've had fireside chats um, in uh, El Paso, Texas and other border regions to talk about research and to talk about what signing up for a government research program means to those communities. Um, we've had um, other uh, uh, events in other places in the country um, through other of our partners where we've had, you know, uh, discussions about what it means for folks to be in, um, you know, dealing with being an essential worker right now and having to go into work while their families are, are not. And so we have had uh, different um, outreach. We've also, the um, National Hispa Alliance for Hispanic Health has done an amazing job of 
of doing little things that just put the program out there and put research in front of families. They've developed um, different culturally appropriate um, games that go out with their newsletter. So families can play games and then they're learning about biomedical research at the same time. So we're trying to do a lot of different, uh, different activities um, to reach the Latinx and Hispanic communities. Okay, so thank you. Um, could uh, anyone you, of you share what strategies have been used to re-engage registered participants who stopped, report, stopped responding and engaging? Who wants to go first? Well, um, oh, go ahead, Susan. Well, I just um, will start by saying at the time, the first thing we had to do was go back to the IRB. Um, to make sure that the methods we wanted to use were okay with them. So did a passive withdrawal, meaning they didn't schedule the next visit, they didn't return the questionnaire, mean they had dropped out, um, or could we consider that just a skipped visit? So we were able to get past that hurdle. And uh, I'll just mention one thing we did was reconsider the time of the visits. As girls got older, they had um, jobs and other kinds of activities, after school activities. So we developed other alternatives. We actually went to scheduling all the visits on Saturdays, but had to consider whether they had soccer games. So we had some very early visits. Um, so we just tried to remove that, as many barriers as possible. Um, I can maybe just share a little bit. As I mentioned, um, we send the main questionnaires up to seven <laughs> mailings. Um, so, and then we call non-respondents up to nine times. I think it's three during working hours, three during the evening, three on the weekend. You know, um, what I mean is if we don't reach them, we can, we can, we let it ring up to nine times. But, um, you know, the IRB and our protection of human subjects and not being a burden on the population does limit the number of times we can reach out to non-responders. And, you know, with 59,000 women in our cohort, there's, of course, diminishing returns. But I think what it can be more important is for some of the sub-studies that we're, when we're doing smaller sub-studies, like my mammogram collection, for example, um, Sometimes what I what people do is after they've gotten um, a person on the phone, a participant on the phone, who's sort of, here's an example, has agreed, yes, I'm interested in participating in the mammogram study. I lost the consent form. Can you please send it again? Um, you know, we'll send it and our, our research assistant will include like a handwritten note on the, on, the, on the cover letter, just saying like, great to talk to you. You know, so some of these personal touches can, can help, I think, um, but I don't have any data to support that. Um, yeah, so those are some ideas. Um, and then I ha had also shown a picture, I, I went back past it really fast, but of a, like a postcard that we send again with photos of our staff saying like, we wanna hear from you. So just like little reminders like that that are not overly intrusive or burdensome. Um, we don't wanna annoy them and make them angry. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's a, it's a delicate balance. Yeah, that's the interesting comment that it's a fine line between, you know, getting what you want out of the participants and keeping them in the study and annoying them. Um, yeah, so Justin, have you got any comments? So for our program, this is something, quite frankly, that we are um, struggling with um, because of the size of our program and mm. the, the, the breadth or, you know, the, the geographic distribution. So, um, one of the things that we recently did is, is we are um, in the process of starting to return the first of our genetic, uh, first of participants genetic information back to them. So it's a, we're starting to return uh, ancestry and genetic traits with um, genetic health information coming um, in 2021. And so that's given us an opportunity to, re to reach out to all of our participants through first email, um, then phone calls, and then a letter or email, letter, phone calls, um, to be able to get them, participants to actually come back in and reconsent. Um, speaking of IRB, we had to do a reconsent to return this information to them. And so we've gotten some really um, positive feedback from participants as we've done this, um, in part because I think they, they are seeing that they are getting something back from um, the program, right? They're getting, they're, they're contributing to the research, but now they're also starting to get something back for themselves, and that's been helpful for us. 
That's interesting. Um, so another question here. Um, so actually in the Cancer Prevention Study 3, we're pilot testing um, an electronic participant portal um, that we'll use for engagement and um, survey administration. So I'm wondering if any of you have an electronic portal for survey dissemination or are all your surveys electronic or paper? And then also, do you limit the length? So I'll go first. Our, all of our surveys right now are electronic. Um, and we, we have no paper surveys at this point in time, although we are um, exploring if we want to do use paper for some, some activities. Um, and they can vary in length from a few questions um, to more than a few questions. We try to keep the length, the length to the minimum to get the, valid, you know, the information that we need. Um, for example, we recently have done, um, we've been doing a lot of mental health surveys around COVID both physical and mental health, but focusing on the mental health aspects of, of the COVID pandemic and being, you know, shut inside and locked in for, for most of most folks. Um, and those, you know, run about 20 to 30 questions, depending on the month when we send in them, but they're, they're all electronic right now. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, Justin reminded me that I, I didn't mention, but that limiting the length actually is one of the ways that we um, retain some of the less quick to respond participants. So if our survey is six pages or four pages, after several mailings, we will reduce it to a two page survey. So we try to say like, this is a brief version of it. You know, can you at least do this? And I also didn't mention that we may even call them and say like, can you just answer a few questions over the phone if you're not interested in filling out the whole survey? Um, so um, yeah, length does matter. We found that when we include a very long food frequency questionnaire, for example, response rates drop tremendously. Um, so the length of the survey does matter. Uh, yes, about food surveys, uh, there was a question just coming in for Justin. Um, what diary data are you collecting? Uh, is it ASA24? How many days do you collect? And how well is that uh, completed? And, and how what percentage of of participants do do it. Yeah, so I was just going to respond to Walter in the chat. So um, we're actually in the process of starting a sub uh, study for, with, uh, within our program that looks at um, nutrition, precision nutrition. Um, uh, and so we, we have not started collecting it yet. We're, we're in the process of working with another part of NIH, uh, the uh, Deepa Kipsi, the, the, the common fund for those of you that know that part of NIH, um, to put that in place. And I think uh, the plan is to get that started with enrolling participants from our study into that sub-study in um, by calendar year 2022. So that's coming. So um, we don't have that yet. Yeah, I'm going yet. Okay. Um, time for one more question, you think, Erica? I think, yeah, one more one. And this one was, was sort of discussed uh, in the chat, but Susan, um, maybe just a bit more on reporting back of the, the PFAS results. Hmm. Yes, well, you know, that was um, an unexpected challenge. Um, so it was PFOA that was the chemical in the PFAS group that we found, found elevated, and especially in one community. I um, will say that all our measurements were made at CDC, which is a CLIA certified lab. So we felt comfortable in reporting back results. Uh, we tried, um, we mailed all of the results. We had community meetings. I would say the community meetings, uh, the attendance was somewhat a disappointment, but we had lots of conversations if we mailed the results. And in fact, when the girls came in for the clinical visits with their parents, that's where most of the conversations about the biomarker results occurred. The advocates, um, really um, were the ones who advocated for returning the results after some initial hesitancy. Remember this was way back, I think in 2007, 2008, when that was not the general practice, but they really felt that the participants needed to know the results of their environmental biomarkers. Well, thank you all very much. It was such an interesting session and so inspiring. And I really would like to go back now and talk to um, our 
PI of, <laughs> for our generation study to see what so we could implement ourselves. Um, I'm sure um, Erica, you, you have uh, similar comments. Uh, thank you so yeah. much. There is now a stretch break.